today I'm going to talk to you about two roses from the Rosa Carolina complex, Cinnamomii. Uh, the ne name of my poster is Does the Polypoid Derivative Smell Just as Sweet, Rosa Carolina and Rosa Palustris, which are the two roses from the Rosa Carolina complex. Uh, these two roses right here, as you can see, are the two roses that I just mentioned, Rosa Palustris and Rosa Carolina. They're very unique and their habitat and subtle morphological differences that they have. Rosa palustris can grow up to over two meters tall, uh, so it can grow very, very high in the wild. It's known as a wetland species. It's usually in very acidic soils, very moist soils, whereas Rosa carolina grows really, really low to the ground, usually under a meter tall, sometimes even shorter than that. Also, Rosa carolina, um, has straight prickles, whereas Rosa palustris has curved prickles. So those are the two distinct differences that you can see out in the field. Uh, even though they look very, very similar, those are two distinct traits that you can look for to tell the differences between them out in the field. What we were looking for was trying to shed light on the origin of Rosa carolina, which we figured out from previous publications is actually a tetraploid, tetraploid that was hybridized from Rosa palustris, Rosa palustris, the diploid species, as well as another Eastern North American diploid species. And we were trying to shed light on what was the actual origin of Rosa carolina from Rosa palustris. What made Rosa carolina become hybridized from Rosa palustris? And we set out to do that using fragrance signatures, uh, using spemi analysis and gas chromatography. The sampling method that we used is called SPEMI, uh, static fa solid phase static micro extraction. Uh, it's a very simple method that we used. Uh, you put a plastic bag over an open flower bloom, as it's noted here. And once you close the bag to make sure that no contaminants can get into the bag, you make a small incision inside the side of the bag and then you can inject the metal casing into the bag. Once you have everything set up with a um, sampler, then you can inject the small resin tip fiber into the bag. And the resin tip fiber is the actual part that collects the volatile components for you. So it's gonna adsorb all of those volatile fragrances that you wanna collect from the rose, and then you'll be able to take that back to the lab. The nice thing about this SPEMI sampling method is it only takes an hour for you to collect the volatile fragrances that you need from any flowering plant. And once you've set it up, uh, then you can you know, let the sample run for an hour and pretty much go about your business. Uh, but once you get back to the lab, or excuse me, rather before you get back to the lab, once an hour has passed, you're gonna uh, take the resin tip back in to make sure that no more contaminants are able to come in contact with that resin tip. And then you'll take it to the lab. So once you get to the lab, you'll use gas chromatography. You'll actually inject the same sampler into the GC, to the inlet. Once you inject that into the GC, the GC is actually gonna heat up to over 200 degrees Fahrenheit, and it's gonna burn all of those volatile fragrances off, and it's gonna produce a nice clean ion chromatogram. And using this ion chromatogram, you can tell what fragrance signatures are actually found in the rose. So I'd imagine that a lot of people are wondering, well, how, are you, how do you know what's coming from the rose and how do you know what's coming from the plastic bag? Uh, we've actually run many samples just with the plastic bag and we've actually analyzed the plastic bag to tell what components are coming from the plastic bag. So once we run an ion chromatogram of the rose and we compare it to other samples of the plastic bag, we're able to subtract all of the uh, volatile organic compounds out that are from the plastic bag and just stick with the fragrance compounds that we need to be able to uh, determine the fragrance signature for the rose. So once we've subtracted out all of the contaminants, uh, as you can see here, I have it color coded and it's also noted by the retention times. It, the retention times will allow you to go into an NIST search database and actually 
determine what each peak is as in terms of volatile or organic fragrances. Uh, so as you can see here, for example, at 12.62, uh, it's noted that that is 2-phenylethanol. And the way that we notice that it's 2-phenylethanol and the way that we're able to fully determine that it is that is we use the NIST search database as well, and that'll give you a probability. Uh, the higher the probability value is and the closer the match of the probability, the better chances that you have that that's the fragrance that you're looking for. So in a lot of cases, for a lot of our fragrances, we would see probability of matches of like 902 out of 902, which is a really, really good value. If you have something, you know, really, really low, like 600s or 700s, or something that's really far off, like 600 out of 800, that's not a really good match. But these matches were really, really close, and they had a really, really high value number, which made the match even better. Uh, so as I was looking at these roses, before I actually got to analyze the ion chromatograms, I was thinking that these two roses would at least have some differences in fragrance signature. Uh, we didn't believe that they would be completely different in fragrance signature, but they would have subtle differences because they have different habitats. Maybe that would lead to different pollinators and, you know, shed light on why these two roses, or why Rosa Carolina was derived from Rosa Palustris. Once I actually got to analyzing the ion chromatograms, we found out that their fragrance signatures were very, very, very similar. Uh, so similar, in fact, that they both had very strong principal constituents in each sample. Uh, so Rosa Carolina and Rosa Palustris both had 1-R-alpha pinene, 2-phenylethanol, cisgeraniol, transgeraniol, beta citronellol, and R plus beta citronellol. All of these compounds have been noted through chemical land as rose fragrances, and that's another reason that we were fairly confident that all of these compounds were coming from the rose and they weren't contaminants from the bag or from outside sources. Uh, so once we figured out the principal constituents in both roses, we were then able to look at the roses and look at the smaller constituents to tell what else was in the rose that wasn't you know, so strong, like as you can see here at 12.62 and 14.64, which are 2-phenylethanol and cis and transdraniol, the relative abundance is almost 100%. But there are lots of other compounds that have a fairly small relative abundance. The other compounds that we found were beta-pinene, limonene, nonanol, alpha-citrol, beta-citrol, rose oxide, and geranial acetate. And they've also been noted as uh, rose fragrance compounds as well, or fragrance signatures in dozens of rose species. Uh, so once we had the fragrance signatures of both roses, we were able to really sit down and compare them through a database. And as I said, they had really, really similar fragrances. And that was very, very unique, uh, being that both roses are from different habitats. So Rosa Carolina, as I said, you know, grows really low to the ground. It's not in a wet habitat. It's in a dry habitat. It's actually called a pasture rose. Rosa palustris is a swamp rose. It grows in very, very moist habitats. Uh, but they have very, very similar fragrance signatures. So if they have very similar fragrance signatures, that must mean that there's some way that they're attracting the same pollinators, because we often uh, correlate fragrance signatures to pollinators or visitors or potential pollinators. Uh, so we didn't actually get to look into any pollinators uh, during my research time, but hopefully uh, continuing colleagues of mine as well as my undergraduate professors will be able to look at pollinators in the future and determine uh, what exactly makes these roses so similar in fragrance signature, even though they live in different habitats and is that fragrance signature that they have, is that correlated to the pollinators? And if so, then why is that making these two roses have such similar pollinators even though they live in such distinct habitat?